Jack the Ripper is one hour. I used to be really into Jack the Ripper. I used to research him a lot, but that was 10 years ago. I was, I was like reading his letters and stuff. Oh, XQC React. You wanted me to watch this for a long time. What Jack was very interesting about his murders in Whitechapel, his murder showed a lot of knowledge. He used to put, he used to put that thing from grapes uh, on the corpses of his victims, which back then in that time could only be afforded by rich people. Maybe that Jack the Ripper was a very intelligent, educated man because the way he behaved and cut and stuff and he wrote this famous letter from hell Whitechapel man I was in Whitechapel three months ago in the late 19th century the city of London was the largest in the world a sprawling metropolis and a melting pot for trade finance how do you know Jack Rivers guy you don't need to be a fucking FBI profiler to know that in 1888 a guy killing prostitutes is probably not a woman man I come on bro come on but in the autumn of 1888, an horrific story emerged from the capital's East End. A story East so End? dreadful, Nowadays it's fucking in the middle of the city. The One after another, destitute women of the East End fell victim to a vicious killer Jack known as Jack Ripper. the Ripper. Uh, talk about Jack the Ripper, they used to make a video about Jack the Ripper with uh, Johnny Depp called From Hell, one of the worst movies of all time. Johnny Depp is hunting Jack the Ripper, and in the end they go with an ahistorical line where Jack the Ripper is fucking Gollum or some shit. And it's so stupid, man. It's It becomes supernatural and super dumb, man. The Ripper was never caught. Instead, the murders came to an abrupt end and left behind one of the greatest mysteries in the annals of crime. Why did he stop though, right? I used to be into profiling, which I, again, I'm just an idiot, but I, if I wouldn't have become a streamer, I always tried to become, uh, join the police. That was my goal other than streaming. The thing about murderers is they don't just randomly stop, right? They have an urge. They can't stop their urge. So when a murderer randomly stops, especially with being this chronological with, I think, seven murders, why would he randomly stop? Something must have happened to him. In the East End of London, there's a district known as Whitechapel. In the late 19th century, Whitechapel was known for its overcrowded slums, where many of the capital's poor and unemployed had taken refuge. Day and night, an army of policemen would constantly patrol this labyrinthine network of dim-lit streets, courts, and alleys. Went to America? One such place was a narrow passage known as George Yard. You can go there in London. They're, they make tours there where you walk all of that stuff with a guide. It was the morning of August the 7th, 1888, when an upstairs tenant named John Reeves headed out for work. Is that crazy? They know so much upon about Upon reaching this the from first floor landing, Reeves encountered the body of a woman lying upon her back in a pool of blood. Horrified by the sight, he stumbled down to the street below in search for help. Constable Thomas Barrett was the first officer on the scene. Five minutes later, He was geez. soon joined by Dr. It Timothy was Killeen, Thomas Barrett. who conducted a brief examination. The woman had been stabbed 39 times primarily in the chest Jeez. and abdomen. And let's just, let's just as a meme, try, act like we're profilers. If you step a woman 39 times, it shows massive hate against the gender. That man had some big fucking issues with women, man. 39 times. Yes. Women hate, if you if, if you watched Mindhunter, it comes from hating your mom because she did something to you, or it's pretty much about, uh, or you got hurt by a woman. But even though it mostly comes down to your mother in the being bad to you. The woman had likely been attacked where she was found, as no blood was found beyond the staircase landing. But this was strange, as none of the tenants in this crowded building Checked had heard a incel. single cry for help. <laughs> Imagine you Jack the Ripper just to be memed by a bunch of internet kids in 2021. <laughs> or disturbance. Sure, no, the victim was Thank eventually you. identified as 39-year-old Martha Tabram. Dude, this guy lived until 1956, bro. And imagine you meet Charles. Hey, who are you? My name is Tommy. I'm a streamer. My name is Charles. My mom was killed by Jack the Ripper. What the fuck? Tabram had made a living through prostitution, and one of her associates was a woman named Marianne Connolly. Connolly testified that on the evening of August the 6th, she and Tabram had been out drinking with two soldiers. Then, shortly before midnight, the party of four had separated. Connolly took her client into Angel Alley, while Tabram guided hers into neighboring George Yard. Barely two hours later, Constable Barrett had spoken to a soldier loitering near the north entrance of George Yard. The soldier had told Barrett that he was, quote, waiting for his mate who had gone away with a girl. Half an hour later, Tabram is presumed to have died. This must be so much research for this YouTuber to make these videos, man. Both Connolly and Barrett were called to upon do. to identify the soldier, but all those accused could provide an alibi. One had been at home with his wife, another at an army base, and yet another in a completely different part of the city. This was enough for Inspector Edmund Reed, the lead investigator on the case, to abandon this line of inquiry. The crime is one of the most brutal that have occurred for some years. For a poor, defenseless woman to be outraged and stabbed in such a manner 
It's almost beyond belief. Only a week later, things would go from bad to worse. Even though right, there's this theory or this, this, this thing that a human being always is making things more exciting than they are. In our brains, we always make stories so much more epic because that shoots us it makes us feel better even though in real life it was much less epic you know what i mean and that's something that you should always apply here on the morning of august the 31st a man named robert paul left his home on foster street and headed for work after making a right turn into buck's row he spotted a man standing in the road the man turned around to face him and said come and look over here there's a woman lying at the pavement the stranger was named charles cross and he too had been on his way to work when he first caught sight of the woman. The two men now cautiously approached, but instead of seeking immediate help, Cross and Paul were more concerned about being late for work. <laughs> Welcome As to such, you. they quickly resumed their morning commute, hoping bro. to notify policemen along this the way. Not baby, I must work. The taxes are coming, bro. I don't give a fuck if this bitch is dead, bro. What the fuck? Fortunately, Constable Sigma. John Neal was just around the corner. Neal right. was equipped with a lantern and found the woman lying on her back with a deep cut across the throat. The wound was still bleeding, and parts of her body were still warm. Upon his arrival, shortly after 4 o'clock, Dr. Reese Llewellyn estimated that, quote, She had not been dead more than half an hour. Upon the body's removal to the mortuary, a shocking discovery was made. Apart from two right? incisions in the throat, the woman had also been, quote, disemboweled. No organs had been removed, but Dr. Llewellyn found, quote, several incisions running across the abdomen. He also believed that the killer possessed, quote, some rough anatomical knowledge, for he seemed to have attacked all the vital parts. Yeah, he was educated. The Wasn't victim was before. quickly identified. Her name was Marianne Nichols, and she had turned 43 just five days before the murder. Nichols had... Here, 1967, man. You could meet a guy whose mom has died by Jack the Ripper in 1967. Isn't that crazy? At least so... Do you think Jack knew who he was going for? Or because someone in chat said they were childhood police or something? But, or did he just randomly choose that shit? It, it seems rather random, right? Because how you can't plan that stuff. You don't know where they go. Which really goes against that theory that someone said that there is, he knows these women? No. Differences aside, the prevailing assumption was that the same deranged individual had committed both murders. It was too loud. As yes. the sun was rising on September 8th, a man named John Richardson was on his way to work. <laughs> They're all working, man. At a quarter to five, he made a quick stop Imagine at that. 29 Hanbury Street. Richardson then sat down on the backyard steps before grabbing a knife to trim a vexing piece of leather from his boot. Once satisfied, he left the building and shut the front door behind him. About an hour later, a third floor tenant of the same address, John Davis, plodded downstairs and into the hallway. The front door was now wide open but the one in the back was closed. When Davis went to open it, he found the bloodied remains of a woman lying on her back just below the steps. What are these three things? Dr. George Phillips arrived at half past six and found the woman, quote, terribly mutilated. The throat had been, quote, dissevered deeply, whereas the abdomen had been, quote, entirely laid open. The intestines had been, quote, lifted out of the body and placed by the shoulder of the corpse. While Inspector Chandler and Dr. Phillips collected a sweep of the backyard, man. but just below the resting place of the woman's feet, they found a small piece of cloth and two combs. The items had likely belonged to the victim, but it seemed to Dr. Phillips that they had been deliberately positioned and arranged by the killer. You think that comb is still somewhere, like in an archive or something? Probably, right? Imagine you have the, that comb somewhere. That probably still exists. Dr. Phillips believed that, quote, the mode in which these portions were extracted showed some anatomical knowledge. This point was greatly expanded upon at the subsequent inquest. The injuries had been made by someone who had considerable anatomical skill and knowledge. There were no meaningless cuts. For instance, no mere slaughterer of animals could have carried out these operations. It must have been someone accustomed to the post-mortem room. Chapman's date of birth is a bit uncertain, but she was roughly 47 at the time of her death. She had at least seven children, but was tragically only survived by two. Oh, so victims are older. Fun. Let's let's watch to the end. But if he didn't kill like a single 20-year-old, that's interesting. But to me, this whole thing is funny issues, man. What, what I feel about this whole thing is, right, how did Jack the Ripper have this many balls? He, putting the corpse here, setting her up, is, is, I mean, this is a five-story home. Is no one hearing anything? Is no one waking up from this? It's not There's no right? get one like every way to untangle this joke, web of joke, contradictions. By this point, the dim light of dawn would have provided the tenants of 29 Hanbury Street an unobstructed 
obstructed view of the murder site, some of whom had even slept with their windows open. What I just said. In spite of this, the killer managed to evade detection. How the fuck? And even made time to arrange the victim's possessions. Yeah, dude. Uh, uh, Tommy knows what the fuck he's talking about. This is so awkward. The public grew increasingly anxious. They were not only frightened by the murders, but frustrated <clears throat> with the police and their perceived incompetence. Even across the pond were the efforts Jabba. of the police fiercely criticized. The London police and detective force is probably the stupidest in the world. <laughs> what these mocking quotes and illustrations failed to capture were the overwhelming odds stacked in favor of the perpetrator. The police were up against someone who seemingly struck without motive, someone who left no murder weapon and few witnesses. On top of that, the East End was severely overcrowded while the police were understaffed. As one newspaper put it, <laughs> anything a man in the east safe. end of London. I mean, that's very far-fetched. Some new theories emerged that say that Jack the Ripper was a facade by organized crime gangs to throw off the authorities with, from a different case. I mean, that's very far-fetched and not supported by any evidence. It's interesting, sure, but... Also, a very good argument against that weird-ass mafia theory is that you fuck your own business up. Why would you make everyone scared of prostitutes? You want to make money through the prostitutes as a pimp. You're killing... You're shooting your own leg. 20 minutes later, the sound of a horse and carriage could be heard trotting down Street. The driver was Louis Diemschutz, the steward of the clubhouse. When Diemschutz drove into Dutville's yard, his pony abruptly veered to the left. When he looked down to his right, he thought he could discern something in the darkness. Diemschutz stepped down from his barrel, and after lighting a match, could see a woman lying on her side against oh, the wall. Man. Without even knowing if she was, quote, drunk or dead, Diemschutz rushed inside the club to check on his wife. When he found her safe and sound, he alerted the other members and a small crowd soon gathered outside. They could now see that the woman's throat had been, quote, fearfully cut, and that, quote, a stream of blood was trickling down the yard. These Eagle, are really Diemschutz, insane, and a few yeah. others promptly dispersed to find a policeman. But across the city, less than a kilometer to the west, an even more ghoulish discovery was about to be made. The fuck? At half past one of the same morning, Constable Edward Watkins patrolled an open space known as Mitre Square. What the fuck? He's Watkins. just... He's just... It's fucking 4 a.m. and he's walking in circles? <laughs> what the fuck, bro? But in the time it took Watkins to complete another rotation, Mitre Square was turned into a crime scene. Wait, ejected two things? Bullshit. I saw the body of a woman lying there on her back. Two in the I same night? I saw her throat was cut and her bowel was <clears throat> protruding. She was lying in a pool of blood. They found terrible injuries inflicted upon the woman's face, throat, and abdomen. The intestines had been, quote, of a group drawn right out to a large recently. extent and placed over the right shoulder. But this is mostly single Among the many lacerations to the face, Dr. Brown noted that, quote, the lobe and oracle of the right ear was cut obliquely through. The woman had died within minutes of her body being found. Did the balls on Jack the Ripper doing the stuff without thinking no anyone, like placing the woman there, knowing no one would come, the risk of that. Like, was he such a genius that he knew all the patterns, how they walk and stuff? That's insane. Back in Burner Street, Dr. Frederick Blackwell and Dr. George Phillips had reached the same conclusion. The woman in Dutville's yard had died within minutes of her body being found. But unlike previous victims, she had only suffered injuries to the throat. There were no abdominal mutilations or anything else by which to connect the attack to the others. But the murder in Dutville's yard and the one in Mitre Square First one like were separated by less than one kilometer and some 45 minutes. This allowed for a chilling possibility. It was suspected then, as it continues to be today, Copycat. that when Diemschutz came clattering through the gateway, he unwittingly interrupted the murder. The killer may even have become trapped inside Dutville's yard because the gate on Burner Street was the only point of entry. Perhaps they saw an opportunity to escape when Diemschutz then rushed inside the club. From there, it would have taken them less than 15 minutes to reach Mitre Square. Plenty of time to hunt for another victim. The balls to the two one But it one must night, be emphasized man. that this is pure But this effective. is just basic Mindhunter. They get more and more uh, risky, right? They get more and more cocky. There is no evidence to suggest the two murders were even connected. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was identified Again, as 44 year old Elizabeth Stride. First, she was seen in the company of a quote, respectably dressed man around 11 o'clock. About a quarter to midnight, Stride was seen talking to a man who was, quote, decently dressed. They always described Jack the Ripper as decently clerk. dressed, like a doctor. Only a few minutes before the murder, Stride was seen in the company of a man by Constable William Smith. The man was carrying a small parcel wrapped in newspaper and was of, quote, respectable appearance. It's unclear whether these descriptions are of the same person 
where if Strider costed multiple clients as the night progressed. There were other witnesses. That makes you think, wouldn't a, a fancy man with money, etc., wouldn't he go for younger prostitutes and not 44-year-olds? Some less credible than others, but the one that really stood out from the rest was Israel Schwartz. About a quarter to one, Schwartz had been walking down Burner Street. As he came up on Dutville's yard, he witnessed a man throwing a woman to the ground in front of the entrance. The woman had, quote, screamed three times, but not very loudly. Schwartz would later identify this woman as Elizabeth Stride. Schwartz did not try to intervene, but opted instead to simply cross the street. That's when he spied a second man on the opposite side, who was lighting a pipe. The man who attacked the woman then appeared to address the second man by shouting the name Lipsky. The pipe smoker then proceeded to follow Schwartz before eventually breaking away. When taken at face value, this story appears to suggest that the killer had an accomplice, an accomplice by the name of Lipsky. This was indeed the interpretation of some government officials. But Inspector Frederick Abeline, one of the lead investigators on the case, had a very different interpretation. You see, the name Lipsky had gained notoriety in 1887 when a Jewish man by the name of Israel Lipsky was convicted of murder. Owing to the publicity of that case, the surname Lipsky had become an anti-Semitic slur. Abeline therefore deduced that the man who shouted Lipsky was directing an insult at Schwartz, who was described as having a quote, strong Jewish appearance. Whether Abeline's interpretation is correct, and you it's never know. doubtful will ever truly You never know. fucking know, bro. Nevertheless, Schwartz's account is compelling, as he conceivably witnessed the moment when Elizabeth Stride was attacked. Back in Mitre Square, a large crowd of spectators had ascended upon the scene, all driven by their morbid curiosity to get a glimpse of the body. The woman in Mitre Square was identified as 46 year old 46, Catherine man, Eddowes. Old. Eddowes had at least five children, all but after old. escaping her abusive husband, she had become estranged from her family. Her last known address was a common lodging house. In, in a way, this whole story is, is a very feminist story because all these m women were drawn into prostitution because they lost their husbands, man. At and they couldn't do anything Florence else. Street. Or their husbands were bad people. What's so incredibly tragic about the Eddowes case is how narrowly the killer escaped justice. First of all, the only private residence in Mitre Square was occupied by a policeman and his family. They had slept right next to an upper floor window overlooking the murder site. Yeah, th this is all Second so Second of all, a night watchman and retired Jackie. policeman had been Dude, cleaning a warehouse fuck, within earshot of the murder site. There must have been so much luck involved. He would routinely hear no the dead. footsteps of patrolling officers, Clever. yet heard nothing at the time of the murder. Finally, Constable James Harvey had glanced into Mitre Square at roughly 20 minutes to two. That's right in between the sighting by Lavenda and the body's discovery. Harvey should have had an unobstructed view of the murder site, yet he failed to notice anything suspicious. Oh, poor guy. Was it too dark? It was was the killer dark, standing then, yeah. just a few meters away, cloaked in shadow? While the killer did ultimately escape, they did not do so without leaving a trace. Shortly before 3 o'clock, a bloodstained piece of cloth was found near the entrance to a building a few blocks to the northeast. It proved to be a ripped portion of the apron worn by Eddowes. The patch had evidently been torn off and then discarded by the killer upon their escape. Whoa, mistake, don't now, on the that. wall above this patch of apron, someone had written a message. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. To this day, both the meaning and the author of this message remain in doubt. Was it written by the killer? Was it an attempt to cast suspicion upon or even a way yeah, wh why will Jack be anti-Jewish man? The guy is hunting prostitutes. Why will he why will this be about anti-Semites? Makes no sense. Be from the Jewish community. But soon he's gonna write that letter, right? From hell. That Similar shit questions is would soon be raised by a few letters. Letters which had supposedly been written and posted by the killer. Where's the from hell letter, man? Yours to that that shit, man. I remember researching that stuff years ago. Thank Three you, days before the murder of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, the Central News Agency of London received a letter in the post, the author of which claimed responsibility for the recent murders and to be planning for the quote, next job. Then, in the aftermath of the two killings, the same agency received a blood-smeared postcard. It contained details about the atrocities, which the author described as a quote, double event. On the off chance that the letters were genuine, the police decided to make them public. 
The hope was that someone would recognize the handwriting. Unfortunately, no one ever did. Instead, it merely served to advertise... Dude, these letters are probably somewhere. Somewhere in London, they're in an archive, man. The, 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 the real, authentic letters, man. ...is the name with which the letters had been signed. Opinions on the letters' authenticity were divided back then and continue to be today. Most notably, the Dear Boss letter had promised to, quote, clip the lady's ears off and send them to the police. The police never received such a package, and neither of the two victims had had their ears removed. The contents of the letters notwithstanding, modern linguistic analysis does suggest that they were penned by the same hand. So, hoaxes or not, the authors were likely one and the same. However, well, the handwriting bore, quote, no resemblance at all to the message written yeah. above the torn patch of apron. Now, the publication of the letters inspired an onslaught of copycats. Agencies all over London were soon inundated with- That must be so with... annoying, Alta. Dude, there's a fucking murder on the loose and you have to deal with all these copycat idiots, man. It's the saddest thing on earth. I will never forget when there was the attack in Halle, where I come from, where the guy was killing two people. You guys remember, maybe? Where he tried to get into synagogue? Facebook, WhatsApp, locally was full of fake news. It was the, the, the most disgusting thing ever, man. The police were trying to do their job and random citizens would make up random shit to fuck with the police. That shit is... That should be end in prison, man. That is so... F Fucked. So Correspondence fucked. imitating the other two. But at least one of them might have been genuine. Not because of the contents of the letter. letter, but rather the contents of a box yeah, that was which it was delivered. There. Lusk was the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, a small group of local tradesmen who sought to identify the killer. The package consisted of a it letter shows Jack cared and a cardboard about box his ego and containing his half reputation. a kidney. The doctors who examined the kidney all agreed that it stuff. was human, but whether it was the same left kidney removed from the body of Edos could not be determined. It could, for instance, have been an elaborate hoax by a medical student or letter, someone right? with access to the human organs. The author of the accompanying letter, meanwhile, insisted that the kidney did belong to the victim and that they had fried and eaten the other half. A popular theory at the time, and one that still is today, was that some of the letters had been fabricated by the press. According to Chief Inspector John Jeez. Littlechild... And, and that just shows, man, in the end, it's not about Jack the Ripper or the victims, it's about money and power, bro. The letters were, quote, They will do whatever they can to sell more papers, dude. Assistant Commissioner Robert Anderson dismissed the letters as, quote, The creation of an enterprising London journalist. Meanwhile, Chief Constable Melville McNaughton thought he could discern the, quote, stained forefinger of the journalist. Whether it was a hoax by an enterprising journalist or the genuine prose of the Ripper, the letters did nonetheless receive widespread attention. They command... Is he not showing it from Hellara? One sec. Um, I sent you half the kidney I took from the one woman preserved it for you. Tatar piece. He sounds like Hannibal Lecter, man. And fried nature was very nice. I mean, I sent you my... The bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed. Catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Jesus, that sounds like so fucking um, Hannibal Lecter. Man. A month which passed without a single atrocity bearing the signature marks of Jack the Ripper. Perhaps it was finally over. It is pretty certain that the monster has become frightened and has suspended his horrible work for the present. Shows intelligence, though. He was able to keep in check his absurd, perverse emotions because he knew it was getting too hot. The morning of November. He wouldn't throw his victims into the He's obviously... It's all about ego. Why would you pre present your victims that openly in the street? Because you want to show you're untouchable. McCarthy was the landlord of Miller's Court, and the tenants of Room 13 had... Little side fact. If you own middle Court nowadays, you're probably a billionaire, man. That shit must be worth so much money nowadays. Fallen behind on their rent. Anyway, um... <clears throat> McCarthy sent at once for his assistant, Thomas Boyer, to collect the money at the quarter to eleven. And he found a woman. After knocking twice without response, Boyer went around the corner to peer through a window. But his view was obstructed by a coat or curtain, so Boyer had to reach through a broken window pane to pull it aside. Uh, creepy That's when he saw the severely mutilated body of a woman lying upon a bed. <sighs> what they found inside was truly the stuff of nightmares. Yeah, man, that it looked more like the work of a devil than of a man. Yeah, that guy was so the whole scene is fucked more up, than man. I can describe. Doctor Thomas Bond must be so weird to live there nowadays. There's probably a house there, right? On described the woman. The room itself was sparsely furnished and offered little in the way of clues. It's a garage two now. Tables, How do you know that? One or two it's chairs a garage now? and a small cabinet. The victim was identified almost immediately. 
Her name was Mary Jane Kelly, and she was the tenant of 13 Miller School. And in her mid 20s, making her the youngest time, victim by far. Very it much. also seems that uh, Jack Ripper was very impulsive, very spontaneous. He couldn't have anticipated to be in a room alone with her. He couldn't have known if the husband was coming home. He couldn't have known that. I mean, this is all just me being an idiot, but he really seems to be very spontaneous and very lucky with it. According to Dr. Bond, Kelly died between 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. Dr. Phillips placed the time of death a few hours later. But some witnesses were quite adamant that they had seen or even spoken to Kelly as late as 8 or 10 o'clock. Yeah, I mean, once again, if you think about the the profiling aspect of it, the murderer gets more and more cocky, more and more. The victims, right? This victim has been mutilated far more than the others. And you really see this uh, Jack the Ripper line where he is more and more cocky, more and more trying stuff. Keep in mind that her body now. was discovered at the quarter to 11. Fucking hell. Mary Jane Kelly is typically regarded as the Ripper's final victim, along with Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, and, and Catherine stops. Eddowes. She's part no of sense, the though. canonical. We just determined, right? I mean, we, but it looks such like an exponential growth. It looks like escalation. Where's the next level of the escalation? Maybe something went wrong. I mean, he's going to talk about it probably. Or five. But why the stop? five victims most likely to have been slain by the same okay. hand. Why did the murders come to such a sudden end? Did a Ripper give in to fears of being caught? Were they imprisoned for a different wrong. crime? Perhaps they succumbed to an illness or committed suicide? Could they have migrated to another country? Perhaps they deliberately changed their modus operandi to confuse the police. The possibilities are virtually endless, yeah, you never know. which means there is no shortage of suspects. So Following the murder of Marianne Nichols, a rumor began to circulate that someone called Leather Apron was in the habit of abusing prostitutes. The name quickly made its way into the press, and soon enough it became synonymous with the killer. In fact, Leather Apron was the predominant pseudonym before Jack the Ripper. This misguided manhunt is somewhat emblematic of the whole investigation. The police pursued even the most tenuous of leads due to a lack of evidence and mounting pressure from the public. They interviewed thousands, investigated hundreds, and developed numerous theories along the way. In the words of Inspector Frederick Abeline, Theories. We were lost almost in theories. There were so many of them. Based on the witness accounts, the Ripper was a man of average height with a medium to stout build in his late 20s to mid 30s. He wore dark clothes, including a hat of some sort, and had a mustache. Not only are many details inconsistent, but they could be describing entirely different people. For all we know, none of the witnesses ever laid eyes on Jack the Ripper. So much is up for debate that one can build a case against almost any suspect. Some have even entertained the possibility that the Ripper was a woman or possibly a man disguised nah, as a that's woman. Bullshit, While man. Jill or Jackie the Ripper is an interesting that theory, is super dumb. it has failed to achieve any widespread support. With this unshakable well, profile in weekends, hand, but one let's stay. take a closer look at it. But it was a holiday, suspects. it was a holiday. What about John Richardson, the witness in the Chapman case who sat down on the backyard steps to trim a piece of leather from his boot? Richardson was indeed suspected by the police, but they found, quote, yeah, that not a shred of evidence against hard, him. Man. What about George Hutchinson, the witness who followed Mary Jane Kelly after she was accosted by a well-dressed client? Hutchinson never clarified his motivation so for shadowing the couple. He merely stated that he was surprised to see a man so well dressed in the company of a woman like Kelly. Was he surprised because he was concerned? Was he jealous? John Douglas. Was it about money? It was him. After all, what? Hutchinson was broke and the client appeared to be wealthy. So the, uh, Perhaps he him. waited outside the court with the intention of mugging this, this well dressed client. There, there are go. many question marks surrounding Hutchinson. He has never been positively identified, so next to nothing is known about his life. This makes it very difficult to build a strong case against him. Hutchinson was interrogated by the police, but ultimately convinced Inspector Frederick Abeline that he was telling the truth. But not every witness attracted such attention from the police. Take for instance, Charles Cross, the man who discovered the body of Maria Nichols. Too old. The argument is that Cross was in the act of committing the murder when he was interrupted by the approaching footsteps of Paul. Cross then concealed the murder weapon and portrayed himself as someone who just found the body. The injuries inflicted upon Nichols would be consistent with an interruption as they were less severe than those of later victims. Mm. What's interesting about Cross is that he likely testified under a false name. 
He claimed to be employed as a carman and his address was given as 22 Doveton Street. But surviving records show City that Pastor? in 1888, this address was occupied by a man named Charles Lechmere. Lechmere was also employed as a carman and on at least one occasion went by the name Charles Cross as it was the surname of his stepfather. Ooh, sus, it is now widely sus. believed that Charles Lechmere was the man who appeared at the inquest very and that he sus. assumed the name of his stepfather when he testified. Was he trying to conceal his identity or was it merely a force of habit? After all, contemporary examples of people doing the exact same thing are uh, not okay. difficult to find. The most compelling evidence against later. Lechmere is that his morning commute between home and work roughly coincides with the time and place of the murders. Mm. <laughs> Spicy shit, bro. Except for the murders of Elizabeth Stride Ooh. and Catherine Eddowes, who were killed on a Sunday, you, the only day when Latchmere would have been free from work. Oh, that guy Not sus. only that, but all the murders were committed around weekends and public holidays. Why would a man who supposedly timed the murders with his morning commute gravitate towards days of rest. It comes from somewhere, but it looks like he had a very good relationship with his it's mom. It's speculated that Stride and Eddowes were killed after Lechmere paid a late night visit to his mother. Mm, good one. While he claimed to be employed at a delivery firm known as Pickfords, there are no surviving records of his employment. If he did work for Pickfords, there is a fair chance that he delivered meat and would thus have been exposed to slaughter and blood on a daily basis. Oh, this shit is good. Lechmere remained in East London until his death in 1920 at the age of 71. I like what Funk says. Uh, every day when this guy went to work, he saw all the hookers everywhere and it might have made him mad. Now, a witness who definitely attracted attention was... If you could have the answer to any criminal case in history right now, which case would you be? I would wonder if Hitler really died in that bunker. Or Kennedy. Yeah, Kennedy is pretty big. Joseph Barnett. So they totally wanted Kennedy dead, bro. They wanted him dead, bro. Joseph Barnett was the man who lived with Mary Jane Kelly up until a few days before the murder. He and Kelly had supposedly met around April of 1887, and they eventually moved to 13 Miller's Court. Now, those who believe that Barnett was the Ripper view his loss of employment as a turning point. The argument is that Barnett she was, was so overcome asked. with guilt and anguish for driving Kelly back to prostitution that he went on a murder spree, murdering one local prostitute after another in a desperate attempt to frighten Kelly off the streets. While most of this is pure speculation, it is true that Barnett disapproved of Kelly's prostitution. This might further explain why Kelly was the Ripper's final and most viciously mutilated the implication being that Barnett felt rejected by Kelly and wanted revenge for the breakup. According to Barnett, he did pay Kelly a visit on the evening of November the 8th, but they had parted on, quote, friendly terms. While the police did subject him to four hours of interrogation, Barnett was ultimately released without charge. I mean, that first guy There is a slight variation of, of this sus, theory which states that Barnett that did murder Kelly, but was not the sus. Ripper. While it's only natural for suspicion to fall upon witnesses and acquaintances, Victorian detectives did pursue other lines of inquiry. One prominent theory was that the Ripper suffered from insanity, and a prime suspect in that category is Aaron Kosminski. Imagine how bad it was for serial killers or murderers once they had the DNA analysis. That shit changed the meta, bro. The that DLC made One of them was Assistant Commissioner Robert Anderson. Upon his retirement, Anderson repeatedly and unequivocally stated that Jack the Ripper had been identified. Without disclosing the name of the suspect, Anderson described him as a, quote, low-class Polish Jew who was, quote, Sounds racist. safely caged in the asylum. <coughs> He'd been identified by a witness who was described as, quote, the only person who ever had a good view of the murderer. This unnamed witness had supposedly refused to testify because the suspect was, quote, a fellow Jew. It comes out that this person, Aaron, was actually in an asylum later. It will totally make sense why the murder stopped. I am almost tempted to disclose the identity of the murderer, but no public benefit would result from such a course. While Anderson never revealed the name of the suspect, his colleagues were a bit more forthcoming. Chief Inspector Donald Swanson revealed that his surname was Kosminski. Yet another high-ranking officer, Melvin McNaughton, described Kosminski as a homicidal and misogynistic resident of Whitechapel. That sounds perfect. Surviving records show that an Aaron Kosminski was admitted to a psychiatric hospital in 1891. Aaron was indeed from Poland, he was Jewish, and had lived in Whitechapel. 
He suffered from auditory hallucinations and a paranoid fear of being fed by others. Dude, imagine making like a movie about Jack the Ripper and you have three main characters, like these three guys, and you follow them and you never know who it was in the end. I just had like an idea for, for, for a movie. Like it's a Jack the Ripper movie and you follow these three characters and in the end you never know who it was. And it leaves you kind of hanging. But in recent years, Aaron Kosminski has been resurrected as a prime suspect due to a controversial DNA Ooh, analysis. Here we go. Okay, so back in 1888, acting sergeant Amos Simpson is said to have stolen a blood-stained shawl from the crime scene of Catherine Eddowes. This shawl was then passed Maybe down like from one generation to the what next the before being submitted for DNA testing in 2011. DNA samples were extracted from the shawl and then compared against maternal descendants of Edos and Kosminski. In both cases, it was a match. What? If the subsequent news coverage is to be believed, the mystery has now been, quote, definitively solved. Aaron Kosminski was Jack the Ripper. But uh, as you can imagine, it's never quite that simple. First of all, How the provenance or April? chain of custody of the shawl is time. severely lacking. There is no evidence of a shawl being found at the crime scene nor is there any evidence of Simpson ever being at the crime scene. Furthermore, a destitute woman like Eddowes is unlikely to have owned such an expensive item. Second of all, the type of DNA used to identify Eddowes and Kosminski was mitochondrial DNA, the powerhouse of the cell. This type of DNA is passed <laughs> down through the female line and is not unique to any one individual. Thousands can share the same mitochondrial DNA, which means it can't be used to pinpoint a specific person. In the words of a geneticist, Based on mitochondrial DNA, one can only exclude a suspect. So to say that the mystery has been definitively solved is uh, widely inaccurate. There's still plenty of room uh, for doubt. Video. Kosminski was not the only suspect advanced by a high-ranking officer. A completely different suspect who still falls into the same category is Francis Tumblety. Looks like a whole four YouTuber. Two days before the murder of Mary Jane Kelly, an American physician named Francis Tumblety was arrested in London. As you can probably tell from this photograph, Tumblety was quite an eccentric character. He was born in Ireland around 1833, but was raised in the United States. From an early age, Tumblety gained a reputation for being a medicaster or quack doctor. He engaged in all sorts of medically dubious practices and advertised himself as the Indian herb doctor. He promised to cure anything from dyspepsia and scurvy to cancer and blindness using nothing but medicinal herbs. <laughs> that guy is a corona denier in 1862. When he was not posing as a doctor, Tumblety was busy running from the law. He was either accused or convicted for crimes like theft and assault, attempt to induce a miscarriage, and manslaughter of a patient. He was even implicated in the assassination of US President Abraham Lincoln, what? but was ultimately cleared of suspicion. Yeah, what the fuck? I don't now, in the early 1860s, Tumblety is alleged to have hosted a lavish dinner party in Washington. Only men were invited to this dinner, and Tumblety had supposedly expressed fierce hatred of women. Furthermore, he showcased a cabinet in his office in which he stored a vast collection of jars filled with anatomical specimens some of which were said to contain the wombs of, quote, every class of woman. By his own admission, he roamed the streets of London until he became familiar with every part of it. He advertised himself as the great American doctor and had a few skirmishes with the police. The purpose of his visit and whereabouts at the time of the murders are completely unknown. Tumblety never stayed in one place for long and made frequent use of false names. What we do know is that Tumblety was arrested in London on November the 7th. According to the press, as well as Tumblety himself, he was arrested on suspicion of being Jack the Ripper. Two days later, Mary Jane Kelly was found brutally murdered, and it's unclear whether Tumblety was still in custody or had already been released on bail. Nevertheless, he was ultimately charged with four counts of gross indecency, which had nothing to do with the murders. But Tumblety had no intention of standing trial. Instead, he made his way across the English Channel, boarded a steamship under a false name, and fled back to America. He was pursued by detectives and kept under surveillance, but his offenses were, quote, not extraditable. Hmm. As such, Tumblety remained in the United States and never returned to England. This so to recap, hard, right? Francis Tumblety was a misogynistic medicaster who was in London at the time of the murders. He even showcased a collection of wombs 
and the Ripper did indeed extract the womb from two of his victims. I mean, he sounds like the perfect suspect, perhaps a bit too perfect. He was Trump's even convicted granddad. of perjury. As such, there is every reason to believe that this story is a complete fabrication. Yeah, that sounds really unreal. Furthermore, that Tumblr was both like older and Tom Charlton with no qualms about the lies and entertaining, deception. Dude. With a suspect like a that, video. one can one never be certain where the lies YouTube. end. And that is a crazy video, bro. I mean, that, that was a crazy good video.